Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Do Nothing Project. I actually made it on time today. Um, I just want to apologize. What's up, Andrew? Apologize to everybody from last week who came and I didn't show up. I completely forgot that happens. I apologize, very embarrassed. I just uh, taught a retreat that day and came home and had all this work to do for 10% Happier and totally spaced on it. So uh, we now have a system where I'm getting text messages during the day to remind me of the Do Nothing project. So um, uh, just trying to build the habit here. And that's something that we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about tonight. So welcome everybody, glad you guys are all here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, hmm. So we're going to meditate, obviously. Uh, but I was thinking about something I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, which I don't think I've ever really chatted about. It's sort of I'm always thinking about practice and what it is and the different ways in which it works. And there's a kind of um, uh, a framework that I've had in my mind for a little while that I thought I would share in the hopes that it's helpful. And it has to do with the scale, the different scales of meditation, the different scales of practice you could, um, and how they work in our lives. And when I say different scales, I mean, um, when we meditate, I, there's kind of like three different scales, time scales in which it's operating. There's the scale of the moment. There's the scale of weeks and months, even years. And then there's the scale of your entire life. And every time you sit down, all three of those scales, it's like nested dolls. They're all, in a sense, happening. Um, and each of those scales, now when you're a meditation teacher and you sit down, and you're teaching someone meditation, in my mind, I have all three of those scales in my head. Some, some practices you might do, and it only has the scale of the moment in mind. It's trying to shift your state, uh, which you can do fairly quickly. Others uh, don't really care what your state is in the moment. They only have the scale of the whole lifetime. Um, I'm kind of interested in all three of those scales. So I'll unpack a little bit what I mean by that. Um, the scale of the moment, is the scale of uh, basically being a DJ of consciousness, a, a mind-body DJ. It's shifting your state, making yourself from being anxious to a little bit more relaxed, making yourself uh, from being uh, totally blown out to being a little bit more focused, changing yourself from being kind of in a bad mood to being in a more loving, in a good mood. These are really important actually. Uh, a lot of what I do at 10% Happier on the app is around right doing these little mini meditations that help people who are really struggling with some issue in the moment who need some medicine, basically a kind of mind-body medicine that can actually shift things for them um, in the moment. So I'll come back to that. Um, the scale of um, weeks and months and years is the scale of habit change. This is what most professional senior teachers are interested in. They're interested in the slow change of habits and it takes a while. It's like you, mind wanders, you come back. Your mind wanders, you come back. Again and again, you're doing that thing. You're slowly building up this habit of more concentration. This is the, this is the scale of, 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 of making substantive changes in our behaviors, in our responses. And this is what's so exciting to me about practice is you can kind of choose, well, what dimensions of my experience do I want to build up and which ones do I want to bring down? You know, me being more focused, more loving, more curious, more affable, more like uh, full of good natured jackassery. Those are all trainings. There's not a quality or a trait in human nervous system and the, and the mind and body that can't be developed with practice. So this is the really, this is the scale of changing um, the gift of who you are beginning to like make little adjustments to it. And it's like, you're kind of, uh, souping up the, uh, engine on yourself and however you want, cause it's the ways in which you want to do that are up to you and your values. You know, this is the place where we learn how to become violinists or artists or, uh, musicians. It's the place of practice and, uh, that work. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. So, but then there's a third scale, which is kind of like the most mysterious one. And this is the scale of 
the whole of your entire life. And this is really where the spiritual dimension of practice comes in. It has to do with, at this deepest level, practice meditation, but not just meditation, meditation, uh, certain movement practices, yoga practices, um, martial arts practices in some ways, um, prayer practices, all contemplative practices. They're about changing your relationship to the whole of your life, to the phenomenon of life itself, beginning to come into uh, develop sensitivities around the connectedness of things, around the, um, uh, the meaningfulness of things. And, you know, this is where there's so much to say about this side of it. This is the part of meditation sometimes that I feel like doesn't get lip service in our hyper secular world, which is really focused on the first two, um, particularly around secular presentations of mindfulness. But really, when you're doing a practice, that's the deep level of what's going on. It's showing you openings to your life as a whole and helping you develop more intimacy in that way. And um, it's a that's the real the beauty, the poignancy, the um, the mystery, the magic. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to say a little bit about that because I, I so when we sit right here, all three of those scales are operating. I am I do try to infuse the practices that I guide with. I kind of point them towards the mystery a little bit, usually in the way that I talk about equanimity and I talk about this. Because in all con deep contemplative practices, big breakthroughs are almost always, always, always preceded by a moment of letting go, a moment of things falling away, of you just sort of like letting go of some struggle, some way in which you were trying to control your experience. You let go of that, and it allowed experience then to catch, to meet you the other coming from the other way. Um, and so that's that's so I do have that element in the practice I guide. I also always try to bring in the just the the ropeness, the good side of the ropeness. Like we're doing our our workout here, you know. In this case, we're going to work with a meditation called the mountain meditation. So just it's really about this is the scale that practice really happens. It's, it doesn't matter what's going on. If you got lots going on inside, if you don't have a lot going on inside, this is a good day. This is a bad day. Still, you sit, you take the posture, you're like a mountain, you come back and it's like you're sitting there and it's like the snow falls on the shoulders and it's the, or it's the fall leaves or it's the summer heat and still you sit or you're tired or you're hungry or this and still you sit. You're building up this capacity for towards the direction of the whole, which is a direction of happiness, independent of conditions. This capacity to be good in all conditions, even if you don't feel good inside and being OK with that discomfort. So that's really the, going to be the emphasis of this practice. And that's really, that's what meditation teachers say when they say, come back to the cushion, okay? And you know, you had this exciting thing happen, now go, go back to meditating. You had this really terrible thing happen, go back to meditating. So I really admire that in teachers and respect that. But there is also finally the scale of the moment. And what the scale of the moment is about is much more about happiness dependent on conditions. It's saying, uh, there are certain conditions going on here and I need to work smart. This is the self-care angle and figure out what's going to work for me in this moment. Um, and meditation can work really well for being something that can shift you in the moment from being in a bad mood to a better mood, from being unfocused to more focused, from being blown out to being more grounded. So that definitely can happen. But sometimes meditation doesn't do that. Sometimes meditation, if you're really, really agitated internally and you go to sit down and do say, a mindfulness practice, it just makes things worse. That can happen. You know, you are your own teacher. You're the one who's got to be tra tracking that and seeing, do I feel better after this practice or not better? In the long-term thing, we hope that you sit down even when you feel good, even if you don't feel good, and you're slowly marching towards better. And you can miss days, you can miss weeks, that's okay. But you're slowly in that march, you resume the habit and you slowly go. But in the scale of the moment, it may be that it requires another practice in the moment. Maybe it requires going for a nature walk. Or if you're like me, you got a lot of energy. I got to go run around the block 20 times or whatever it is. I don't have too, I got too much agitation to sit. Sometimes I can sit and I'm agitated and it cools out. But you got to be the one doing that test. <laughs> Nobody else can do it for you. So um, 
Okay, shit, that was a ton of information. I was inspired. I, I don't know why to talk about all that. Um, I hope you guys found it helpful. Uh, now let's meditate. Um, we're going to do, uh, like I said, practice that's called the mountain. Stole this from John Kabat-Zinn, although no doubt he stole it from lots of people. It's kind of all over the place. It has to do with the cultivating an attitude of real steadiness of, in a sense, that you're going to sit with yourself independent of the conditions. The weather systems are gonna change around around you in terms of the distractions, in terms of the inner stuff, but still you're gonna sit with poise, with composure, with a sense of completeness. And we're gonna bring the mountain into us a little bit. Um, and so all my guidance is invitational. Um, if at any point you just feel way too upset or whatever, I mean, it's like any time with meditation, you got two opportunities, that two strategies there. Um, you can focus in or focus out. Focusing in means going right into it, and kind of opening to it and exploring it, and it, that opening can help move some of that stuff. Or you can focus away on a different object completely, like your breath or the mountain pose. Or, I mean, focus away also means stop meditating. Um, I just say that because I think it's important that people know uh, that there's different strategies available to us at different times. So it's uh, 812. I'm going to do this guy for about 25 minutes. I'm going to get myself comfortable here. Uh, uh, the mountain pose. My friends, I will see you in 25 minutes. Let's party. And by party, I mean, let's close our eyes, try not to fall asleep, and pretend we're mountains. Here's my contemplative reminder, the beginning of silence and meditation. May it take you on three time scales simultaneously into your life. The mountain. Okay, so first decision, eyes open, eyes closed, user's choice, completely up to you. If having your eyes closed leads you into a lot of daydreaming, you might want to have them open at half-mast. If having them open makes you feel too exposed or like you can't relax enough, then consider closing them. Kind of feel it out, what works for you. You can start by taking a couple of deep breaths. As you breathe in, sort of stretching up the spine. And as you breathe out, it's the, the downward motion, the, the settling motion. And as you do this, you can really soften your forehead and your eyes. Soften your cheeks and your jaw. Soften the shoulders and the hands. Sometimes the hands are tight, let them be soft on your lap or your knees or wherever it's comfortable. Finally soften the belly itself. That's right, you're allowed, you don't have to like do the beach body here. You can let the body really relax, letting the tension go in the belly and the shoulders. So we're working with these two. The upper principle is the alertness, the straight spine, the sort of poise in the posture. You know, they talk about taking the one seat. So can you sit down and find almost a, a kind of dignified upwelling in the way you sit? And we'll work with that more when we get into the mountain. It's like, yeah, I'm proud to be here. Not in a cheesy way, but like a, like a I showed up way. And then the exhale is the downward motion. That's the relaxation. So you're calm and settled, but alert. So riding that line between alert, present, and relatively chilled out.
So I want you to bring to mind the image of a mountain. So for some of you, you can probably have good visual imagery. Some people have that where you can actually visualize a mountain and make it like majestic, like a big rocky mountain, like sheer powerful sides, like the weight of granite and stone in the mountain. Like it just surges out of the forest or wherever your scene is in your mind's eye. But it's, it fills you with like, oh yeah, that's a mountain. And for others, maybe don't have a strong visual. That's like, I don't have a super great visual. I can see some, it's maybe, maybe more an idea. But you're kind of visualizing a mountain or you're thinking about a mountain. And just take a few moments here just to kind of check in with the qualities of the mountain. First of all, this uprightness, of course. So that reminds me to keep my spine up. The stillness of the mountain. The strength. So check in with your mountain. That kind of surging out of the mount mantle, that, that girdle of stone compacted by, you know, it could be a couple billion years. So this thing has got history, patience. So if this feels cool, kind of see if you can bring the mountain into your body. So what I mean by that is literally kind of pretend you're a mountain kind of take that image as an archetype and sort of internalize it. it. There's a quality here, almost like you're slowing down your body clock. And you're settling into this old, old, old form. It's an ancient form, as old as the planet. Nice long out breath. So in terms of what to pay attention to, there's a few options and you can kind of choose what works for you. One is you can just be in a more open awareness where you're aware of things, distractions, sounds, but you're not really bothered with them because you've got this intention to hold this mountain pose, this intention to literally be a mountain. So your main meditation practice is just feeling yourself as a mountain. Every time you forget about it, you just re-remember. Reset your intention. And you don't really need to be paying attention to more other than that. But for others, you might want an anchor. That could be the feeling of the feet on the ground as you're breathing up mineral energy from below you or the seat on the, on the, on the chair or the cushion, breathing up like you're girding yourself with that mineral strength, breathing into your form, or maybe the breath, or some other object. And in all cases, our intention here is to embody this absolutely still mountain. So try this for a while.
Good, so we're literally, well, no, not literally, metaphorically embodying the mountain, finding the, the stillness, the solidness, a mountain, or maybe it's a thousand foot stone statue of a meditator of the Buddha. But it's like, you know, on the mountain, the seasons change, snows, and then it's spring, it's rain, and it's the beating sun, and then it's the fall leaves. And but the mountain is self-sufficient, independent of the weather happening on the surface. It's just this enduring, implacable quality. You can literally slow everything down. Seeing if we can match something of that timelessness. A sense of being okay, regardless of what the conditions are. There's this deeper commitment to stay concentrated, building that muscle. Staying aware and awake. But also open, present to quantumness. Not getting uptight about distractions or thoughts. This mature accepting. These are the trainings of months and years, trainings of a lifetime. And we do them with the indomitability of a mountain.
Good. So this is our mountain meditation. The breath may start to slow or get more subtle. That's fine. Or there may be distractions, thoughts, sounds, but you're sitting still in the middle of all of it. Allowing it all to be there, not ruffled, not bothered. There's a steadiness here that we're cultivating this capacity to be with ourselves in a way that's content, centered, independent to those conditions. It's a kind of horizon line to aim for. We may, we may never totally arrive, but we can definitely build up capacity in that way by doing just what we're doing right now. Steady patient, appreciative of slowness, of stability. And even if we don't feel that way, the intention is enough. Just holding the direction, holding the container for ourselves to feel whatever we feel. That is the mountain. That's the essence of it. Our willingness to be sometimes with our own discomfort. So keep sitting. Good, so staying present. You might be lightly paying attention to the breath or to the steadiness of your whole posture or to the ground underneath your feet or your seat. You might just be more in open awareness, but in either case, we have this deeper underlying intention of steadiness, of patience, of bringing the mountain into our bodies. Letting everything slow right down. We could wait lifetimes here. That kind of patience.
Okay, good. Just getting to the end here. So yeah, you've been practicing a mountain, but coming back in your human body now. Taking a few deep breaths here at the end. Of course, you can keep meditating if this is working for you or you're enjoying it. If you're ready to finish up, I'll just ring the bell here. breaths come up on the feet now it's like the mountain on your shoulders you're like a giant stone monster in the middle of the mountain shaking off the mantle coming back into the human world but with that nice chilled out quality hopefully who knows so thanks guys for meditating with me um yeah, so in terms of those three scales, maybe you feel more chilled out now. So the scale of the moment, changing your inner experience, that can happen. Feel more settled or grounded. Problem is, sometimes that doesn't happen. And then people go, oh, wow, this didn't work for me. Meditation didn't work, and I stopped doing it. And forgetting that that's only one of three scales. Way bigger, way bigger than the... Uh, the scale of the moment is a scale of months and years coming back to the habit. Times are tough, times are easy. Whatever you sit, you sit building up that capacity to make those commitments. That's really the training of meditation. And then finally, moving you towards that third scale, the third scale of your life. Even if it's just like appreciating the fullness of your life in this new way, that's a lot of what it is. Appreciating that you are alive. It's like, damn, I forgot. I was just a droid. You know, and then you're like, whoa, uh, this is the biggest gift ever that I got to exist. <laughs> so that's what I mean. Um, calmer, more patient. More patient. Nice, Brenna. So cool to do this with you guys. I love it. <sighs> it's awesome. I think we hit a thousand subscribers, which is cool. Uh, so it means I can start to use a better my phone to get a better video because this video is crap on my laptop. Also, maybe you guys think I should like make it look nicer. I just do it wherever, but I guess I could think about making it more of like a nice scene with like a Zen thing on it. And this is just my couch. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd answer a couple questions. Um, Okay, didn't quite get the scales this time. Okay, well, you can reread it, uh, or, or, you, or you probably listened to it the first time. Well, um, I, I explained it okay. I just maybe just say quickly again. Um, I mean, I guess it is a bit of a weird concept. Just that the operational, the, the effect of meditation is happening on three different scales. It's happening in the moment, potentially to shift your state from being all excitable to more chill, from being super chill to more energy, if that's the direction you want to go. So different practices are going to do different changes in the moment. Um, so it's like that affects the change in the moment. That's the scale of the moment. Then there's a scale of months and years, the scale of behavior change, habit change, becoming in general more a calmer person, more concentrated, more friendly, to name three very well-known trainings. And then there's finally the scale of your entire life, the whole beginning to appreciate yourself as part of a whole. This is hard to talk about because it's the weird contemplative spiritual thing or like the trippy mystical thing, but it's it's not esoteric. This is like philosophers are interested in this, like physicists are interested in this, naturalists are interested in this, anybody who's interested, grandmothers are interested in this. It's the scale of feeling a sense of your whole life around you in some way, whatever that means for you. I'm making it very general here. Um, so those are... Those that's a little bit about scales, but I'm gonna say I got I people have been sending in questions and I'm trying to I want to try to get at them. There's lots of them. Uh, I want to try to get at a few. There's this guy from Daniel here. Daniel has a question about getting back into the habit and then also dealing with feelings in meditation. Getting lots of feelings questions, so I'll maybe answer a few of those right now. The getting back into the habit. He said recently I got a health scare. I had to go to the hospital. 
but my progress in mindfulness helped me stay focused during a situation. Back at home, unfocused, anxious. Feels like maybe he lost some some of that progress. How would you recommend getting back into the habit and not feeling bad about my lost progress? Well, I mean, hopefully that's self-evident now, the answer to that. There is no lost time on the scale of your life, on the scale of even months and years. It's a drop in the bucket. It's like practice is going to go up and down. Sometimes you're going to fall off the wagon. You won't sit for a few weeks, a few months. Who knows? It's like that's going to happen. Or you're there practicing all the time, and it's hard one day, easy the next. It's like, and still you sit. There is no wasted time. It's like it's all going towards this big picture. So how do you get back? You go back. You just start. And you build back up again. You know, a lot of the gains in meditation, it is like a user to lose it thing. Like you get more and more concentrated and then you fall off the wagon, your concentration drops a little bit. But there are some shifts in meditation that aren't like that. It's crazy. Insights, things you start to understand, you don't forget those things. You don't, you can fall off the wagon all you want. They're going to be with you. So there's a sense in which, you know, that's, always getting trained or built towards the big life picture. So that would be my answer to that. Um, but he's got a second part of a question there. Um, uh, when he sits down to meditate, I'm not always plagued by feelings, emotions, patterns. There are plenty I deal with outside of my sitting sessions. But after some concentration, most of my worries tend to fall back temporarily. When that happens, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be actively bringing up the feelings, patterns I want to address generally, things that he's working on. Or I'm only supposed to tackle feelings that present themselves in the moment. Great question. Um, as always, you know, it's there are so many ways to do this practice. It's up to you. You know, there are practices that are called trigger practices, where you deliberately think about challenging stuff so you can basically have equanimity and open to them and begin to work through them. That's a legitimate way to work with our stuck material. Meditation, the equanimity part of it. It's an incredible tool. Uh, so that might be something you want to do. However, I would say it's not only if you feel like doing it. Most people only work with their stuff in meditation if it's getting in the way. Most of the time, if, if you find that stuff is chilling out, then that's cool. Just stay in the more relaxed state. You know, just appreciate it. Know that actually the more you're equanimous you are with whatever's going on, the more that stuff trickles down into your nervous system and helps cool out those patterns. So it's not even like you have to hit a pattern head on in order to work with it. Just the act of sitting in stillness, pretending to be a mountain, whatever's going on, does have this larger effect in our life. It's amazing. This is why meditation is magic, why people are just like, why everyone's into it, you know? Um, so I hope that answers your question. I think I would just let yourself enjoy what's going on. Then when stuff comes up, even then you have the option to go with it. If you feel resourced, like, hey, I can open to this, I wanna feel it a little bit, then you can go focus into it. If it gets too intense and you feel like you don't have the capacity to deal with it right now, then you can do this titration thing where you kind of come back, chill a little bit, um, then maybe go back in a little again, or you don't work with it at all. You just sort of let it be there in the background and do your main practice, which might be focusing on the breath or whatever. So there's lots of options. It kind of depends on your intention. It depends on opportunity, what's coming up in the moment. I mean, there's no cookie cutter solutions here. This is why it's such a creative thing practice too. Um, really interested in helping you guys uh, be your own teachers in a sense, beginning to think of this as like, oh yeah, this is part of being a human being, having this responsibility. Um, so let's see, there's another question here about feelings, since feelings are feelings. Everyone has feelings. I have feelings too, and they fuck me up in a huge way. I hate feelings sometimes. I think I'm gonna do a whole uh, post at some point about state specific knowledge and feelings, how when you're in a strong mood, it feels like this is fate. Everything is screwed and always will be and always has been, you know, when you're in that mood and then it passes and you're like, oh, that was weird. But it's in the moment, the feeling is like utterly, it's like it's always going to be there. Same with the, the, the mania. Same with the whatever it is. You know, I'm a, I'm a specialist of mood disorders here from the inside. So I will talk more about that. But okay, here's one. Dealing with strong emotions in life and in practice. This is from uh, M, MK. Um, first initial M, last initial K. 
Uh, she, so she says, there's two pieces of advice I'd like to reconcile or better integrate. One is from one of your guided meditations on 10%, simply staying open, where you say, notice your contraction, tightness, relax, kind of behind it, stay open. So this is more of an open awareness type advice, uh, open awareness instruction that I gave. And the second is from Joseph Goldstein, a uh, far better meditation teacher than me with far more experience, a luminary. She's not saying this. I'm saying this in the world of, uh, of uh, Western Buddhist practice. Anyway, he says um, he has one called opening to strong emotions where he does a simple noting practice. Oh, anger. Noticing anger. Oh, fear. So noticing the emotion and noting it. And she says, I take it that both are means of allowing experience to happen without reactivity and better responding. Exactly. They're different techniques, totally two different techniques. I do lots of noting techniques too. They're different techniques of working with experience. She says, I, I get that. But uh, she asked, do you find yourself using one or the other in certain specific situations? Should I treat them both, open awareness and noting, as equally fair means of exploring strong emotions and do what I feel like at the time? Yes. <laughs> That's the answer. Because as always, it depends on you. It depends on what your own experience is showing you. Some people find that an open awareness practice is all the practice they ever need to do. They just sit, they open, they close their eyes or they're, they're open and they're just sort of in a more open practice. They're just aware of what's happening, but they're not really trying to anchor in on any one thing. And that's their go-to practice. It seems to bring more equanimity, clarity in their life, more concentration. It seems to be less reactivity overall. They never deliberately work with stuff. Um, if stuff happens in those moments, they can just sort of let it be in the background or they can decide to take a more active role into what Joseph is describing and decide to note the emotions, meaning, okay, I'm gonna, that's what I was just calling focus in on, focus towards. So begin to pay attention to, well, where I'm feeling a little anxious, where do I feel that anxiousness? Is it in my chest? Is it vibratory? Is it a pulse? Is there images and is there talk? I mean, I got plenty of these, the rain meditations I've done on my, on this uh, site here are all about that. But basically kind of like, you're like a private investigator, feeling it out, opening to it, learning how to be with the discomfort of it. And basically these emotional reactions, they tend to look like a bell curve. It kind of might get more intense as you open to them, but if we can stay with it, then they can kind of cool out. There can be this immense satisfaction of, wow, I just sat through this deeply challenging feeling and I stayed with it. I let it be there in this very mature, caring way. And it sort of, seem to work itself out and now I'm on the other side of it. So that's a wonderful thing. And sometimes it does that. Sometimes it's like, hey, you're going up the curve and you're like, no, nope, <laughs> too much. And you back off, let it happen another way. There's no rush. So um, so the answer to that is that uh, both of those, it's kind of like what works for you as a strategy. If, you're, if you are interested in working with emotions, then you can work more directly with that noting one, uh, or you can kind of work with them indirectly, like, that you'll have to just do the experiment and see which one works for you. Some people find that the more open awareness practice is just more effective uh, because it's too intense to go into them. You know, that can happen. But if you feel like you got the resources and it's, help, it's helpful, then you can do that. Um, it's just a matter of kind of investigating and doing a little bit of exploring on your own. You know, it forces you this perspective to begin to, to be your own teacher. All right, guys. That was a lot of talking for me. 8.53. This is one of the longer ones, making up for last week. Um, I'll be back next week. Oh, shit. I'm not going to be back next week. Next week, I'm going to be on a mountain. I'm going mountain climbing. I'm going mountaineering on a outside of Banff in Alberta up on this glacier. I'm going to learn how to like pull people out of crevasses. My buddies are making me do this trip, which will be awesome. So I'm going to be in like a place called Bow Hut. You can Google that. Bow Hut, Alberta, outside of Bow Lake, way up at 10,000 feet or whatever. Hopefully not dying, and I won't have web ability to do this. If I do, I'll try to do it. I'll, maybe I'll email them and ask them if they got the wireless. That'd be cool. Do it at like up there. But otherwise, I'll, it'll be the um, uh, it'll be the the week after. Uh, many thanks, guys. I hope you have a good night. I hope all this chatting hasn't got you all worked up. If it is, you can do another mountain meditation. Nice.
All right, peace out.